I want to talk about now voting restrictions. So there are a lot of uh, different types of ways that, that voting is restricted. So um, one, obviously, uh, I'm sure you've heard of, of signature match for, for mail-in ballots. Uh, by the way, some level of signature match is actually done on in-person uh, votes as well. Um, uh, polling place location. Um, there were stories uh, about you know uh, very affluent areas with smaller populations having lots of places to vote. Uh, by the way, most of the white people uh, and poorer places with um, lots and lots of people having only one or two places to vote. That there being lines around the, uh, around multiple blocks. Uh, it, it, these just ridiculous lines for people to vote. People waiting five, six, seven hours uh, to vote because um, pe people really do want to vote. Like. Despite the fact uh, that voter turnout in the United States is always low uh, comparatively to other countries, the people who, who, who do it, they, they're really trying. They want to vote. They want to express, um, they want to, express to the, the powers that be, this is my voice. This is who I pick. This is what I want. Um, and, and, and stumbling blocks are put in their way. There was another, uh, you know, it, putting polling places near... Uh, public transportation stops, uh, sorry, putting them away from public transportation stops, which essentially limits people who don't have cars uh, from getting to them. Um, what are some of the other ones? Um, yeah, there's, uh, there's the, oh, um, drowning out, uh, using redistricting to drown out uh, groups of people's voices. That's another kind of election fraud, as it were. Uh, re requiring IDs or requiring only certain types of IDs. Uh, one of the most flagrant violations of, of election rights, in my opinion, that I've seen, uh, voting rights in, that I've seen, in my opinion, is um, I think it was Texas, I don't know for sure, uh, that essentially said if you have a driver's license, uh, a hunting license, or a fishing license, that was an acceptable ID, but, um, you know, uh, a non-driver's license or uh, like a, a school ID or something wasn't allowed. And, and like the people who are more likely to have guns and fishing licenses are typically, again, people who can afford uh, those types of hobbies. And again, most of them are white. So, uh, and of course, not everyone has a car, not everyone gets a driver's license. So to require um, driver's licenses for voting essentially says to anyone who lives in large urban areas who don't have cars, uh, screw you. You don't get to vote because you don't have um, a license. So, look, it, it, I, I do think there is a proper way to credential people who have uh, who who are voting. Um, but if you are going to credential people who are going to do uh, who are going to participate in voting, you need to give them that credential for free. You need to make that credential easy to get. Um, you know, you need to make sure that essentially everyone can do it. But the truth is a lot of these electoral fraud schemes, they, the whole point is to stop people from voting. Um, and traditionally, um, uh, especially in general elections, this has been Republicans who, uh, the Republican Party who has done a lot of this, although the Democratic Party has done uh, some of this during their primaries, they're typically better in the general election about uh, election fraud in general, and they're better about calling it out uh, in um, general elections. But for the for primaries, they're they're not as good. So it, you know, this isn't a one party issue. Uh, there's there's plenty of land to go around here. So um, all right. So there's a new bill uh, that passed the House. It's called HR one. And it really is a great bill. Uh, there's a couple of things I disagree with, but um, there are a, a lot of great things in it. Um, one of the things that stood out to me is that if you're an elected official who, uh, sorry, if, if you are an election official, not elected, if you're an election official and you're running in an election, you have to recuse yourself. That would, of course, um, uh, cure the, uh, the kind of strange things that happened in Georgia with the Stacey Abrams, Brian Kemp election. Um, there are, uh, there's a requirement that judges have to have a certain code of ethics and a code of conduct, not really related to elections, but it's definitely a, a good thing. Um, 
there's one, uh, there's a provision that makes illegal uh, things like putting a polling place uh, very far away from public transportation, saying that if you're going to, uh, essentially saying that if you're going to have polling places um, be few and far between, they need to be near public transportation. I think, uh, I think it's up within a mile of public transportation. I'll, don't quote me on that. Uh, if you want more information on HR1, actually, the best place to go, because uh, I'm doing this from memory, is it to go to the Brennan Center, uh, the Brenner Center for the Brennan Center for Justice. They have a whole, essentially, line by line write up of the entire law. I've read it through a few times. Uh, I really suggest you do. It's a great, uh, first of all, it's a great resource, and they really do kind of talk to people um, like they're normal people, not like they're lawyers, even though I am a lawyer. Uh, it's a great resource. You should check it out. It has all the details about the bill there. Um, the other thing it would do is require automatic voter registration. Um, I didn't mention it earlier, but one of the ways that voting can be restricted is just to make it difficult to register to vote, right? So sometimes you can only register if you're getting a driver's license. Uh, sometimes, you know, you have to register through the mail. Well, the mail costs money, right? Uh, and look, I get it, 54 cents, whatever, but, but you know, is you, sometimes you have to request a form, you have to request a form online that requires having a, an internet capable device. And it, it should be free. Free. F R E E, zero money, zero cents. Zero money, zero cents, zero dollars, zero cents. Oh boy. All right. Um, but yeah, so one of the things that we do is provide automatic voter registration for all people uh, who are eligible. So essentially, as soon as you turn 18, you become registered to vote in your municipality. Uh, which is great. We want, that is definitely a way that we could improve the number of people who vote in our elections. Uh, I believe there is a provision in there having to do with um, how many polling places per capita you can uh, you should have. Uh, super useful. There is a restriction. There is a ban on using uh, postcards to determine if people have moved. So one of the uh, one of the tricks that was used to stop people from voting uh, and to create these voter purges was that um, the, the local county election office or whatever would send you a postcard and say, hey, you know, uh, sign your name, send it back to us if you do. Um, that's proof that you're still living here and you won't be purged, which sounds perfectly reasonable, except uh, many voting advocates have pointed out that these um, these postcards essentially looked like campaign mailers. They looked like spam. So people just threw them out, right? Because look, we get tons of mail that's just junk. I get like um, a, a circular from the local grocery store every week that like just like goes like right from my door to the recycle bin. Um, there's like nothing in there. Uh, but like if they put it in there, <laughs> right? Then you're not even looking at it. You're just tossing it. Um, so, and then of course, for every one of those that weren't returned, the immediate thought was, oh, well, clearly this person doesn't live here. They didn't return our, our stupid postcard that looks like junk. Um, so we can purge them from the rolls. So lots and lots of people were purged from rolls this way. And uh, HR1 bans it, uh, which is great. So as I said, there's, there's lots of really great things in HR1. You should go to the Brennan Center. Uh, I think it's BrennanCenter.org or BrennanCenterForJustice.org. Uh, just Google it. You'll find it. And they have a whole write-up on HR1. Uh, it's really great. They also have some anti-corruption provisions. And these are where I'm a little frustrated. And I, I'm going to tie this into my next segment on disclosure versus regulation a little later. Um, but essentially, the gist of these anti-corruption provisions are, well, we have to know where the money's coming from. And we have to know who's donating to whom. And they can't just hide behind these the names of these organizations. So I'm sure you've seen, I'm sure you've seen political ads, right? We're all spammed with them, and you and you see these like innocuous names like Americans for Prosperity or um, the Center for American Progress or Friends of Insert Candidate Name Here or a Committee to Elect So and So, but. You, you don't really know who's behind them. I mean, because a lot of these are, are PACs and super PACs, um, Citizens United allows people to pour literal unlimited amounts of money into them. And they are not supposed to coordinate with a candidate, but, you know, 
there are lots of ways that candidates have gotten around that um, or have done it and just not been prosecuted. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but the federal, uh, the federal Election Commission is staffed by an even number of Democrats and Republicans, and they don't do anything. Um, I don't think they have prosecuted anyone for, uh, you know, campaign finance crimes in the last like 10 years or so. Uh, at least since I've been following politics closely, I don't know of a single person who has ever um, been been prosecuted for it. I could be wrong about that. Correct me in the comments below if I'm wrong, uh, and I'll make a correction next week. If there is one. Um, not the next week. There will definitely be a next week if there's a correction. Anyway. Um, so... The idea is, okay, well, so now we're going to know which super rich people are funding our, our candidates. I just, but that doesn't stop the corruption, right? I mean, what does knowing who the ad is purchased by do for you? Or seriously, what does it do? I mean, there, there are some names of donors that, that float around in, in certain circles, um, you've got the baddies on the on the right, um, you know Sheldon Adelson, the Koch brothers. You have the the baddies on 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 the well, they're definitely not on the left, but on the Democratic side, right? You have um, uh, you know Bill Gates and and them, and who's the other one that there? Oh, George Soros, right? The one that anyway. So you, you kind of have your, your big bad billionaires on, on both sides of the party aisle, uh, not necessarily both sides of the ideological spectrum, but, but uh, other than that, like, okay, so you, okay, so let's actually just, let's, let's start that premise there. So you're a Republican, you see that a candidate um, is, is funded by Bill Gates or, or the, the committee for who's he, what's he, elect, whatever, is funded by Bill Gates. You weren't going to vote for them anyway, most likely, right? So what does it do for you? Or by the way, if, if you're, I mean, it, it doesn't really do anything for you. The influence is already there, right? Other than trying not to get them elected. But I mean, again, if they have that much money and they have that much, the ability to run ads like that, you, they're just marketing. It's just marketing. They're getting the name of an individual into your head so that when you go into that battle ballot box and you think to yourself, who do I want to vote for? The name that you've been that your brain has been pumped full of for months and months and months is going to come out. You know, if you're, if, if there's an election where you don't feel strongly, um, and essentially, ooh, wow, hello. and essentially, you know, you're just going to vote for the, the X or the Y, you know, then it, it wouldn't have mattered any. So my, my frustration with this and is, is that essentially, it's saying, well, corruption's okay as long as we know who's doing the corruption. And I just fundamentally disagree with that. The, the fact of the matter is the influence is bought. We still have politicians that are bought and paid for. So no matter how much we know about the people who are influencing them, the truth is a lot of them are still going to get elected and they're still going to be influenced and they're still going to have influence peddling. Uh, so, and, and sorry, and their donors are still going to have influence over them. Um, because as I explained last week, I think, uh, money in politics isn't, like it isn't back, back rooms with cigars and whatever, it, it's just people who you feel ingratiated to and you call up um, and ask for favors and ask for advice. So I, I think the, the so-called anti-corruption provisions, uh, as far as they are of a disclosure nature, um, are just not adequate in the slightest. Uh, I, I don't think that there is a good argument that disclosure is a better manner of regulation than regulation itself.